It is Tuesday, April the 21st, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining the social, economic, and geostrategic concerns in a world ever-changing due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I am Bill Whalen, a Hoover Institution Research Fellow and the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Fellow in Journalism. And the best part of my week is moderating this conversation in which three Hoover Senior Fellows, Hoover's Goodfellows, offer their unique insights into what lies ahead in these uncertain times. Let's meet the Goodfellows beginning with John Cochran, an economist in the Hoover Institution's Rosemary and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow. John's also the author of the Grumpy Economist blog, which you should certainly bookmark as a must read every day. Hello, John, how are you doing? Good morning. Quite well, thanks. We're also graced by the presence of Neil Ferguson, the Hoover Institution's Milbank Family Senior Fellow and a renowned historian and author. He's also the host of Neil Ferguson's NetWorld, a three-part PBS series on the intersection of social media technology and the spread of cultural movements. Neil, each week I labor impossibly long hours trying to figure out something clever to say to you. And I realize that it's like being at Wimbledon and I'm offering a very weak second serve to Roger Federer. So how are you doing, my friend? I was terrible at tennis. I gave it up very early on. So you've struck a nerve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Our third good fellow, last but certainly not least, is Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, the Hoover Institution's Fawad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow, and prior to coming back to Hoover, the National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. General McMaster is also the author of Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. It's coming out this fall, but you can pre-order it right now. Hello, H.R., how are you today? Good, Bill. Good to be with you. Okay, we're going to start with you on the hot seat, my friend. I want you to talk about a terrific essay that you wrote for The Atlantic that came out just the other day, How China Sees the World. Uh, the tagline that caught my eye, HR, was where you described the Chinese strategy that you describe as, quote, co-option, coercion, and concealment. Can you expand on that? Well, th well, thanks, Bill. I'll tell you, very soon after taking over the position of National Security Advisor, China was you know, at the very top of the priority list for obvious reasons. Uh, among them, uh, that China was important to the strategy for North Korea, but, but principally because we, there was a recognition, a broader recognition across the administration and certainly on the part of the president, he had made it clear during the campaign, that our policy toward the Chinese Communist Party was not working. And it was based on some fundamentally flawed assumptions. And so what we did very early in the administration, I think in my first couple of weeks there, was convene the principles committee for what we called a a small group framing session, which we did when we were encountering and, 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 and trying to understand better the most significant challenges to national security. And it was in that session that we examined what had been implicit and fundamentally flawed assumptions of previous policies, mainly that China, having been welcomed into the international economic order, would prosper and therefore liberalize its economy, play by the rules, and over time, liberalize its form of, of government as well. And I think it was apparent to, to everyone, it should have been apparent to everyone by early 2017, that that, that, that assumption was, was flawed. And we need to replace that assumption and others with new assumptions and, and assumptions that are based really on paying due attention to the ideology, the aspirations, the emotions that drive and constrain the, the Chinese Communist Party leadership. And, and of course, foremost among those is, is the party's desire to, to extend and tighten its exclusive grip on power and the associated fear of, of, of losing control. That drives so much of the Chinese Communist Party's policies, as does this aspiration for national rejuvenation. The problem is, this is a Chinese Communist Party, <laughs> and this party is, is, advancing, is, is advancing a different model, an authoritarian, uh, an, an authoritarian model, a uh, closed model, a statist economic model uh, that is in competition with ours, and China is pursuing its aspirations at our own expense, and of course, it's pursuing this exclusive grip on power at the expense mainly uh, of the Chinese people. We've seen all of this play out uh, under the COVID-19 crisis. Right. And it's, I think it just is important for us to recognize the need to compete. Ch the Chinese Communist Party is not going to become a responsible stakeholder in the international order. The Chinese Communist Party is undermining that order in an effort to replace it with a new one that is more sympathetic 
to right. the Chinese Communist Party's agenda. HR, you'll find John and Neil Ferguson writing a lot about China on their respective sites. Uh, you will find Neil Ferguson uh, on a Hoover Institution podcast, The Pacific Century, in March of last year, talking about a Cold War with China. Neil wrote a column about this December of last year. Are you comfortable with that phrase? And then John and HR, I want you to jump in. Uh, John and Neil, excuse me. Well, I think it's, it's different from the Cold War. Uh, I never disagree with Neil and John, <laughs> but but I think it's different. Time. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's different from the from the the Cold War that that we knew in our in our younger days, uh, because obviously, and as John will be the first to point out, is is the global economy is much more interconnected. China is more interconnected with the global economy than than the Soviet the Soviet Union was, and so it's a much different kind of competition that that we that we are that we're in now than than the Cold War competition. But I, I think what we, what we ought to view it as is, is not a war, but really as just that, a, a competition and the need for us to really be active in, in arena, competitive arenas that we vacated uh, based on the flawed assumptions that drove our policy previously. So I think what we're in now is, as, as we were talking about in a couple episodes ago, is we're in a, in a decoupling competition in, in large measure. And, and it's not a decoupling that's brought about by you know, President Trump's tariffs or the so-called trade war, the, the tech war with China, it's brought about by the policies of the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, how can you conclude at this stage that the Chinese Communist Party is a trusted business partner? It's very clear whether you're the NBA or, or Marriott uh, or, or any business that, that, that has had to really give up uh, their, their, you know, their, their rights uh, a, 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 by, to do business in China, but then also conform to the policies of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, that China was not a trusted partner. And what we've seen, I think, with the COVID-19 crisis is disruptions to, to supply chains that were overly reliant or exclusively reliant in some cases uh, on, on China. And so I think what's going to happen is, is in large measure going to be free market driven. And I'd, I'd love for Neil and John to share their, their thoughts on this. So I'll stop talking here. But I, I think that, that there is a broad conclusion uh, that is being reached by our other free and open societies, our like-minded partners uh, across the, the world, that, that it is just too expensive, not just in an economic, uh, from an economic perspective, but too expensive from a geopolitical perspective uh, to, to continue to aid uh, the policies of the Chinese Communist Party. Why don't I have a go at defending the Cold War II thesis? Uh, I don't disagree with anything uh, HR's uh, said, except that I do think it's a lot more like a Cold War than than we want to admit to ourselves. Uh, I, I actually was a big admirer of what, of what you did in government HR. I thought the national security strategy was a massive improvement on its predecessor, uh, the last one that was issued by the Obama administration, which made believe that China was somehow still uh, a partner. But as I was thinking about this last year, and it was about this time last year that I wrote my first article about Cold War II, I was remembering how intertwined the United States and the Soviet Union were economically at the end of World War II, and how quickly, just in a matter of a few years, decoupling happened, and uh, we went from being allies to being adversaries. And exactly as has happened in our time, uh, many people in the United States didn't really want to admit that that was happening. It took a while, actually, for the reality of the Cold War to sink in. It actually took Winston Churchill to point out that an iron curtain was, in fact, being drawn across the world. And I think we're at rather at the same early stage of Cold War II. Uh, the Chinese know they're in Cold War II. I've yet to meet a representative of, of the Chinese government that has disagreed with me about this. And I've made the argument in front of quite a few uh, Chinese uh, uh, delegates at conferences. So I think if you if you put yourself back in the late 1940s, you see a bunch of things that are in fact rather similar. Intellectual property theft was something that the Soviet Union was rather good at, and it started, of course, with the atomic bomb, and it went from there. And we've come to realize that China has actually a very sophisticated system of espionage and intellectual property theft. 
uh, in the United States and around the world uh, today. And it has to do that because it's only through IP theft that it can compete technologically because it's still behind, for example, when it comes to the most sophisticated semiconductors. So there is a sense in which, rather in the same way as at the beginning of the Cold War, uh, China's having to do what the Soviet Union did, and that's to cheat in order to, to catch up. Uh, then there's the ideological element. I, I think we should uh, recognize, uh, as H.R. rightly said, that it's a communist party which retains, especially under Xi Jinping's leadership, considerable commitment to certain principles of, of Marx and, and Lenin. I was uh, in Beijing last year uh, and had a meeting at which I was informed uh, by a communist party representative, in fact, the head of the party's research uh, department that the, the standing committee of the Politburo had recently been rereading Marx and Engels as communist manifesto. So there's an ideological component too. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course there's just good old-fashioned geopolitics. Mm -hmm. China's uh, expansion to essentially turn the South China Sea uh, into a part of its, uh, its military infrastructure uh, is really old-fashioned uh, great power politics which was also a part of Cold War One. So I think what, what's struck me most over the last few years, and I think I've probably been in China more than anybody else on this, uh, on this show, has been the shift in atmosphere since Xi Jinping came to power. I think the project of liberalization wasn't entirely a doomed venture under his predecessors. Uh, I, I certainly remember a time when going to Tsinghua and teaching there uh, felt like uh, going to a pretty open society. That has really changed uh, under Xi Jinping. I, I think he's turned the clock back in a whole range of ways, economically and ideologically. And I think more than anything else, actually, it's been his leadership that's made this Cold War happen. So I'm, I'm the skeptic here, uh, though um, no fan of uh, totalitarian regimes, let me tell you. Uh, I, I really enjoyed HR's article and, and I recommend it. Um, I'm, I'm a little, as, as an economist, uh, what are their objectives? This, uh, HR is exactly right. Understand your opponent and what he or she wants uh, is really is something we tend to forget to do. And I would say, number one, uh, they want to stay in power. You're exactly right. Uh, first of all, like, like most despots around the world, they want to wake up tomorrow morning, which isn't uh, guaranteed to be true, especially if you're like Kim Jong-un. And then they want to stay in power. And, and I regard their turn to authoritarianism in part as out of fear that this is difficult. And HR's article is good on that. They, we, in America, we tend to think of authoritarians as being very confident and yes, I run things and tell people what to do. In fact, they are very scared. Um, and that's clear in the article. Uh, HR points out their view that they have a very narrow window uh, a, a very chilling HR, by the way, <laughs> those of us who've read uh, World War II history and how Germany felt in the late 1930s, this concept that China feels that uh, it has a moment now uh, to burst forth, but that soon demographics and the limits of their state-run economic system uh, are going to hurt them. That's a perception uh, that, that they are scared and they turn to authoritarianism because they're scared. Now, um, there's a problem when we talk to China and we understand what they want. What we fundamentally want is for them to go away, for the Chinese Communist Party to lose power and China to become a regular country like other places. We also want to cooperate with them on things. We want them to do stuff in the short run. We want them to have <laughs> better health and safety protocols, to tell us what's going on uh, in, in, in their markets, to not uh, invade nearby countries, to, do all, to behave better in all sorts of ways. And as we deal with many authoritarian regimes, um, North Korea, um, uh, Iran, there's this problem. Um, if, if, if you get to the meeting and say, we want you to leave power, they say, there's nothing to talk about here. Uh, and in some sense, the short run deal has to be, we put off trying to kick you out of power. You get to stay in power, but you'll do X, Y, and Z that we want you to do, like stop stealing intellectual property, behave a little better. But, if you tell them, and by the way, leave power, that, that's not happening. Um, so I think they are fearful. And, and I think our, if we don't want to start a war, a real war, uh, and we want to negotiate with them, we want them to do stuff we want to do, uh, the hard choice is they get to stay in power. We'll keep whining about it. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's behave. So I think that that calls for a, a, a strategy of 
I, I want, what I want to get to from both of you guys is, is more particulars about what it happens to. Now, this virus I regard as being a disaster for China. And both of you in previous things have said, oh, they're, 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 they're uh, running a propaganda war about how great they are. I mean, you look, we were also talking about some survey data. Uh, nobody around the world trusts China anymore. Uh, nobody in China trusts China anymore. This has been an internal disaster. Everybody inside China knows their government is lying to them all the time. Um, they may go through the app of Xi Jinping thought, but they all know it's bullshit, just as the Russians did in, in the 1980s. Uh, so this really, I think, is the, the idea that China is the great wave of the future, uh, I think this has laid bare there not. And that, you know, that's even true financially. Uh, right now, you know, much of the world is falling apart. Who are you going to call? Zero, zero, one. <laughs> no one's asking for trillions of, uh, of renminbi to be sent to them. They want good old U.S. dollars. Um, and, you know, China is doing lots of stuff to try to spread its view around uh, since World War II. We've been doing lots of stuff to try to spread our view around. We send money all over the place. Uh, we, you know, we bail countries out when the Germans invade. No one seems particularly grateful for it. And, uh, and the idea that China is going to buy goodwill by building you a port, which you can nationalize anytime you feel like it, if you don't like it. I, I think, I think we, we shouldn't be once again too paranoid about that. So I think we should turn to uh, specifics. Yeah, we, we know what China is. We know they are in some sense a strategic uh, uh, competitor, um, that there's a, there's a strategic question there. Um, we are not ready to uh, say our goal is uh, you guys have to leave power and we're not going to talk about anything else. So what are we going to do? And that's some form of, of containment. And, and what are the rules for that containment? Now, um, you know, specifically, there, there are things we could do. Like, how about we recognize Taiwan? That, that would certainly uh, make them mad. <laughs> um, how about we start spreading our message around the world, something the U.S. has been particularly uh, bad about. But I think, I think that the, the strategy for China has to remain engagement. Uh, if we cut them off the way we cut ourselves off and the way, the way Russia, cut it, Russia cut itself off from us, because it didn't want our bad ideas. Uh, the more people who go back and forth to China, uh, the more flow of ideas there. Surely, surely, as we turn this conversation towards specifics, you guys don't want to go back to nobody from the US flies to China and nobody from China flies to the US and the exchange of ideas is gone. That would be a terrible idea. Economic engagement, you know, right now you want some masks, who are you gonna call? The only people who know how to make them are China. And uh, you know, they have export now, They they turned around and put export controls on us, then they won't you know, send us masks. Um, economic engagement uh, is, is a useful way of, of keeping ideas going back and forth, and it's useful for us. We don't, you know, if you're only mask production facilities in North Dakota, the good old US of A, well, when that one gets COVID-19, you got nowhere to turn to. I mean, global, robust global supply chains are, so, so, is if you, HR says compete, and I want us all to remember, compete is fine if you're talking about ideas or military. Competition to export more to you is not economic competition. So, but John, I don't think that's what HR is talking about. Maybe we should give HR well, a chance. Well, let me just introduce what I think what we should be talking about. What are we specifically, uh, what are you guys specifically re recommending that we do? I think we're going to agree on a strategy of, of containment, pressure, um, with its wink, wink on we're not going to directly uh, kick you out of power. And what are the steps? What do you mean by competition? Uh, go on then, HR. I think you should answer that and I'll have a go after you. Sure. Great. Well, by competition, first of all, the, the objective has never been, you know, for us to force the Chinese Communist Party out of power. And I believe, and I think it's really clear based on the actions of the Chinese Communist Party, that their greatest fears are internal. You know, what did they do just a couple of days ago? They rounded up the usual suspects in Hong Kong to prevent any kind of dissent there. You know, what are, what are they doing internally uh, with this creation of a, a digital Orwellian uh, police state, you know, far beyond anything Orwell imagined uh, in, in 1984? You know, what are, what are they doing with one to three million people in concentration camps in Xinjiang province, uh, for, for example? 
uh, the, the great firewall to keep information away from their, their people. So, so should we be, so should we be, should we, let's just, let me just stop in on specific. So should we be supporting the protesters in Hong Kong explicitly or trying to undermine their firewall? I know we, we you know, we, we make a lot of noise and we should about their horrendous treatment of, of Uyghurs and other minorities. What, what should we be doing? I, I think we should advocate for people having a say in how they're governed and in, in having a say in protecting their individual rights and, and for them to be free from oppression of this or any, or any other authoritarian regime. Now, it's not our job. It shouldn't be our responsibility to secure freedom for other peoples, uh, but, but we should be supportive of these movements. I mean, what, what people have said in the past is, well, you know, the, the Chinese are, you know, they're culturally predisposed to, to want to live under authoritarian regimes. Well, of course, you know, the big the, the big lie to that is in Taiwan, right? An extremely successful uh, democratic uh, society that, that dealt very effectively with with COVID nineteen. Also, had just had a very successful election. Has and, also and, 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 and Chinese so, move to America seem to enjoy uh, American democratic values, and they're not voting to put in a Chinese Communist Party here. But please, please go ahead. <laughs> well, the, well, I th I think you know to, to your point. First of all, it's not our policy to, to un for us to unseat. The, the Chinese Communist Party. I think what we should demand, we have to demand, uh, is, is, is that China behave like a responsible nation in connection with respecting their own citizens' rights, but also that, that, that they engage in, in free, fair, and reciprocal relationships with us uh, on, on trade. And this, this crosses over right into the economic competition. I mean, you know, just take a look at, at all the unfair uh, barriers to entry to the Chinese market the forced transfer of intellectual property and sensitive technology to gain access to, to the market, the, the party's subsidization of state-owned enterprises so they can produce goods at artificially low cost and then dump those goods back on the global market to drive our companies out of business and our workers uh, out, out of work. Do you wanna, the, 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 the absurdity of, of, uh, of us giving access to Chinese telecommunications companies. <laughs> when, what kind of access do, do Western uh, telecommunications companies have in China? Zero. Same thing with, with uh, in the fintech sector, for, for example. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of the, the aspects of the, of the economic competition, is that it, it ought to focus on China making good on what the Chinese Communist Party promised to do when it was granted entry into the WTO in, in, in 2001, uh, for example. Other areas of competition, uh, Neil are already already mentioned, uh, which is you know, to make clear that nobody owns the ocean, nobody owns the South China Sea, and and so that's that's a military and security aspect of, of this competition, but but the other aspects of this of this competition have to do on us really getting better ourselves as well. First of all, defending what has been a really sustained campaign uh, to to steal uh, intellectual property and sensitive technologies through industrial espionage. Um, as, as well as, as the information efforts you've seen, as, as ham-handed as these have been. And I agree with you, John. I mean, I think this is going to blow back on the Chinese Communist Party. You're already seeing inklings of this in, uh, in Europe. I'd maybe ask Neil to, to comment on this. But, but I think that this is going to be a clarifying moment for the free and open societies of the world to confront this authoritarian regime and its egregious behavior. As I mentioned, you know, I, I think that, that the economic decoupling, I think it's going to happen naturally because, because it, it, China is not seen as a place where you want to do business a, anymore. So, um, and, and the, the lure of the, of the Chinese market is, is I don't think, gonna, is no longer going to be adequate enough to, to outweigh, uh, you know, the, the emotional, the political cost uh, of continuing economic relationships that force you to compromise your, your principles. So um, what, what do they want? I think it, it's, it's pretty clear what the Chinese Communist Party wants is that they want to obviously maintain their and tighten that exclusive grip on power internally. Uh, and, and they want to, to expand their influence internationally in, and are clearly attempting to create exclusionary areas of primacy across the Indo-Pacific region while they position themselves to compete from a position of advantage against the United States and other free and open societies internationally, and to get, gain a dominant position unfairly uh, through, through, through a number of these practices uh, in the emerging uh, data economy uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, and I think, I think their ambitions are, are really nothing short 
then gaining a dominant position in global logistics infrastructure uh, and, and, and global supply chains. And, and you know, I, I, mentioned the, I mentioned the story in the, in the essay uh, about uh, Lee Kashong, you know, when he, was, <laughs> when, when he went into his monologue, it was, he, he made very clear what he saw America's role in the future economy, to provide China with, with, with agricultural, uh, agricultural products and natural resources. Uh, and, and to be in a subservient uh, role uh, in, in the global economy and, and geostrategically as well. I think it's worth uh, seeing HR here as playing the part of George Kennan, who, of course, was uh, the, the American diplomat who oh, spelt out exactly what the nature of the Soviet challenge was, and that needed to be done. I think we're in the same position today that we need HR to spell out uh, to unworldly economists like John the nature of the Chinese uh, challenge. And I think it's, uh, it's it very important to be concrete about this. John, nobody was proposing regime change uh, in Moscow in the late 1940s or at any point in the Cold War. That's why the Cold War analogy is so helpful. We need to go back and remind ourselves, we got that right. The containment strategy prevented Stalin from taking over Western Europe the way he'd taken over Eastern Europe. It also prevented uh, the, the Soviets taking over the whole of the Korean Peninsula, uh, which was another of Stalin's move, even if he used Mao's China as a proxy. But, but more importantly than that, during the Cold War, we conducted a kind of full spectrum operation of containment. It wasn't just military. It also involved speaking up uh, on behalf of dissidents uh, something that uh, some Americans uh, resisted, but I think was extremely important. It's very, very unfortunate that in all the turmoil of the pandemic, the U.S. government hasn't spoken up about the detainment of uh, opposition leaders in Hong Kong that happened over the weekend, reported in the uh, in the uh, U.S. press, but really more or less ignored otherwise. And, and that's the kind of thing that I think we can learn from the Cold War. We're not about regime change. We're about preventing China making the kind of moves for, let's put it bluntly, world domination that the Soviet Union attempted uh, consistently during the Cold War. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be the same. I don't think we'll be fighting proxy wars in Indochina or Central America. But I do think on a couple of key fronts, we really do have to be uh, on our toes uh, and doing the kind of containment that, that HR is talking about. Uh, number one, Made in China 2025, as opposed to Made in China 2020, which we could perhaps label COVID-19, Made in China 2025 is a Chinese government strategy to achieve self-sufficiency in high-end semiconductors. China imports way more of those than it imports oil. It's highly reliant on US, European, Taiwanese, uh, and South Korean technology. And they are aiming to be independent in that respect within a matter of, of five years. Uh, a part of China's strategy for uh, global uh, dominance is, of course, to make sure that the 5G networks of the entire world are made in China by Huawei. And we have been struggling to come up with an effective counter move uh, to prevent that becoming the global standard, because right now, uh, Huawei can essentially underbid uh, any Western competitors like, say, uh, Ericsson. And let me add one final point right up your street, John. Uh, China is very aggressively developing various forms of digital currency, of electronic payment. It's ahead of the United States uh, because Alipay and WeChat Pay are increasingly global standards for making payments with smartphones. And now we hear that in the midst of this crisis, the People's Bank of China has in fact uh, rolled out its, uh, its digital currency. It's actually in use for making payments uh, in certain parts of China. This is the new face of Cold War. It's not gonna be like Cold War One. It's gonna be about things like 5G networks and digital payments. And I'm very much afraid that unless we listen to what HR is saying, we are going to lose this Cold War because let's face it, there was no guarantee at the outset of Cold War One that we were gonna win that in 40 years. And in some ways the outcome came as a surprise to many people. So I think that's why this analogy is useful and why I think HR is playing the kind of role that George Kennan played all those years ago. Well, I think you guys have it exactly right on the strategic threat of China, exactly right 
that we are we are are not in a position we we sh we should be thinking regime change, but we're not in a position to do it. So it's going to be a strategy of containment, and exactly right on the strategic, uh, military, international cooperation. That does mean working with our allies, as we did after World War II. You can't go it alone in a world where you want to ring. Hundred percent. That's a really but, key point. I agree completely. But um, uh, yeah, each each nation goes it alone in the West is not going to is not going to stand up to China. But I think you guys have it exactly wrong to uh, take this Cold War analogy and apply it to economic competition. That's just not the way economic economics works. It's not about fair trade. It, it, HR mentioned subsidies. Uh, uh, the, the US is complaining to other countries about subsidizing. Like for example, our air, uh, uh, we just bailed out our airlines. Boeing is practically a state-owned company. Our banks are practically state-owned companies. When it comes to subsidizing things right and left and then uh, subsidizing export markets, it is awfully hard for us to throw stones in that department. And the economics of it are, you know, if the Chinese government wants to tax their taxpayers and send us free stuff, the right answer is a little thank you card and some chocolates. Economics is not a competition in that way. Uh, and I think that's the you know, intellectual property complaint. And now, stealing is bad. Um, maybe the US should worry, you know, why is it our computer security is so bad it's easy for them to steal? Um, but you know, the, the common complaint, for example, that uh, you know, in US companies are forced to share property, intellectual property, if they want to work in China. Well, if, if the deal ain't good, don't sell in China. And I think your point is right. Uh, companies are waking up that maybe the deal isn't so good. Uh, fundamentally, though, the way, uh, you know, the idea that they may have this aspiration that their state plans are going to dominate the world. Lots of people have written aspirations that their state-run industrial plans are going to dominate things. And, and it never seems to work out that way. Uh, I would be curious for, for Neil for a historical analogy. The Soviet Union had five-year plans all the time about the wonderful things it was going to accomplish. It never well, John, to... John, since well, you well, mentioned gonna... the, the Belt and Road Korea Initiative. Korea has a, a wonderful set of plans about how it's going to be self-sufficient and run it. And that never seems to work either. Um, this this is too glib a reading of history, John. I must, I must interrupt you and object. Well, I need one last thought here. World history is full of empires that expanded into territories that they regarded as economically exploitable. And if you look at the way that one belt, one road, belt and Road Initiative has been played uh, by China, it's a, in many ways more reminiscent of of a 19th century European imperial project. If you look no, no, at no, the no, ground, no. Those, those imperial projects came with guns. It, they did not come from selling things to people. They came from invading countries. This is not, not correct, John. I'm terribly sorry. But the, to understand imperialism, which, uh, which economists need to, because frankly, John, economics is not a separate branch of human activity. It's an integral part of the realm of power. And if one studies the expansion of, say, the European empires overseas, what's very striking is the way in which they combined, rather as China is doing today, commercial expansion, ideological expansion, political expansion, and of course, military expansion. So, so I think it's very, it's naive, frankly, to, to say, oh, these things never work. Well, tell that to the people who were under European rule for large parts of the 18th and 19th centuries. I think we shouldn't really rule out the fact that China's empire in significant parts of the world is growing rapidly. They have influence in a really growing number of, of African, Caribbean, and South Asian countries. And they are looking to turn that economic influence uh, into political influence. Nice. The idea that we should just lie back and send them a thank you note for cheap junk, uh, that seems to me to be the essence of strategic uh, naivety. Well, let me suggest a tax. Mr. Bill's, Bill's well, question at the, at the beginning. Job. As a tactic, suppose we want to compete with China. We want to be the ones to build the 5G networks. Uh, the right way is not to stop them. The right way is to compete. The way you compete in, in most sports is you get better at it. Why is America slow to develop this stuff? Uh, well, why is America slow to do all sorts of things? You know, we, why, why are we slow? Why is China developing apps that let you track COVID-19 and the U.S. is not? There's a whole list of regulations that get you in the way of the U.S. We, we are the, uh, we, we are the, uh, the Gulliver um, held down by thousands of regulations. The way to compete is to do it better ourselves. And if, if competition with China leads to a national rejuvenation, we do business so well 
that to a country, it's obvious you want to buy it from the U.S. supplier rather than Chinese, great. If it's, uh, you know, force, force the Chinese not to do things that they do well, that's, among other things, that's just not, not going to work. Uh, you know, you mentioned Belt and Road. The, the, uh, so the Chinese are pretty good at building things fast. And can you imagine a country inviting the U.S. to come in and build the port for it? Yeah, we'll be there 15 years after we get the EPA reviews done. I mean, the U.S. is terrible at this stuff. Uh, you want to compete? Clean up at home, and that's going to compete beautifully. Mm -hmm. HR? Well, uh, th this is the, gets to the question that Bill uh, raised at the beginning, this, this campaign of co-option, coercion, and concealment. And, the, you know, the new vanguard of the Chinese Communist Party is a Chinese Communist official, party official, <laughs> with, with a Chinese National Bank uh, representative with duffel bags full of cash to grease the skids for the deals within these countries. They use corruption to co-opt leaders. They use, they use uh, terms that are ultimately unfavorable to the people of those nations to get their foot in the door, in debt these countries, set the trap for them, and then once that trap is set, to use that trap to coerce that country to conforming to Chinese uh, foreign policy priorities, uh, as well as to giving uh, China access to, to critical infrastructure and, and data, you know, as, as really a, a, an increasingly critical resource uh, that, that is going to drive the, the future economy. So, so once, once they have that coercive power, it's very difficult uh, for that country to be able to exercise its sovereignty. This is, in many ways, a new form uh, of colonial subjugation uh, of, of these countries. Many, uh, many journalists in, in, in Africa, for example, have called it just that. The other, the other, the other well, campaign that China is on is a campaign of stifling uh, individual freedom and, and, and rights. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, look at the countries who have no better friend than China. I mean, it, just it went, the short list uh, are these authoritarian regimes that are eagerly importing not only Chinese investment with all these strings attached, but they're also importing the Chinese version of the of the surveillance police state a, a, as well. But what's your alternative here? On, so, well, so well, the, alternative, the alternatives don't allow them to get to that third C, John. Which is, is the U.S. going to build ports to, to, to portray these practices? I mean, this is just normal business practices. It's not normal business practices. Is, is the U.S. going to an effort to establish these exclusionary areas of influence that put the U.S. and other like-minded nations in a position of economic disadvantage, but also in a position of geostrategic dis disadvantage? But is, is the and so, I, so I think there are many ways we have competed, and we've seen it already. Okay, so so what what has the Trump administration done since it really adopted a fundamentally different approach to China? I mean, I think I, I think probably the largest shift in, in foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. There has been really across the government effort going on here, as well as coordinated efforts with like-minded partners, which you don't hear about very much. But it, but it involves, of course, the the trade negotiation. Where the, where the administration used trade enforcement mechanisms to get China to the table, the phase one deal. It's not satisfactory, uh, but, it, but it's a path that we're on now to, to, to demand a reciprocal trade uh, relationship uh, with China. On the One Belt, One Road initiative, besides exposing the egregious abuses uh, associated with it, we're working together with allies and partners to provide alternatives to establish, first of all, international standards for, for infrastructure investment internationally, which ought to be apparent with the first one being your know, transparency. Uh, but, then, but then also uh, working with others like Japan. Japan's, Japan's investment actually in infrastructure uh, across the Indo-Pacific is greater uh, than, than China. So when you work with like-minded partners, you're able, you're able to compete effectively. Other areas of competition involve defending ourselves better against this campaign of industrial espionage. You saw, for example, in December of 2018, you know, 15 or so countries uh, sanctioning and indicting uh, entities associated with APT10, this, this hacking entity that's run by, uh, was run by the People, People's Liberation Army. And then once they got caught too often, it moved under, under the uh, Ministry for State S Security. You have, I think now, an understanding that we have to compete more effectively uh, from a military perspective in terms of maintaining our differential advantages. I mean, how could it be 
<laughs> that we allow Chinese companies that are building their future air force, building their future space capability, building their future naval capabilities to list on, 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 our, on our exchanges. And, and, and so, so the Americans, American pension funds, are funding the People's Liberation Army's effort uh, to, to, cr to create dilemmas for us in, in future armed conflict. So you know, I, I think that competition doesn't have to lead to confrontation. In fact, I believe our failure to compete had put us on a path toward confrontation because the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party uh, and their arms, such as the People's Liberation Army, were becoming emboldened by, by the lack of competition. And we were wondering, hey, you know, why are we getting our butts kicked here? Well, we're getting our butts kicked because we weren't even on the field. You know, we weren't even in the arena. We had vacated all these, these, these arenas of competition. And now what we're seeing, I think, uh, become increasingly important is, this, is, is our diplomatic and informational arenas of competition as well. And as I mentioned, I, I'm, I'm optimistic about this. I think that I think we are waking up to this challenge uh, and I think this is a challenge that is not a U.S.-China problem, right? Everyone always tries to frame this, you know, this is really a, you know, a Trump versus Xi or U.S. versus China. Hey, this is really the, the free world <laughs> and those who adhere and, and are sympathetic, John, uh, to, to, to free market economic systems and free market principles against a, a closed authoritarian statist economic model that is, that is not just content to do what, to do to, to impose this system on its own people and to stifle their freedom and to stifle their productivity, but wants to extend it that, that system internationally and is doing so very aggressively. Neil? I was thinking as we were having this discussion about the work I'm doing on, on the biography of Henry Kissinger, and Kissinger's major strategic uh, claim to fame, I suppose, is the opening to China, the, the creation of uh, at least the first uh, 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 steps towards diplomatic relations between the United States and the People's Republic of China. I asked him uh, at a conference in Beijing at the end of last year whether he agreed with my view that we were uh, in a Cold War. And he replied, we are in the foothills of a Cold War. Now, when Henry Kissinger acknowledges that the relationship has come to that uh, stage, uh, then I think we all need to take notice. And I agree with HR. I think part of what went wrong was that we were asleep at the wheel and that did embolden that those elements in, in the Chinese Communist Party who do have uh, world political uh, ambitions. I'm often reminded to just try another historical analogy that Kissinger's used himself in, in, in his book on China of Germany uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, th there's something of that in, in modern China today, a kind of near arrogance about the capabilities of their, of their industry, a sense that the English speaking empire is decadent and really no longer to be taken too seriously, uh, an ambition which is uh, increasingly explicitly geopolitical and a kind of historical grudge, that hundred years of humiliation narrative that you'll hear trotted out by party officials more or less every time you sit down for a cup of tea with them. It's all distinctly Wilhelmin. Uh, and that I think is perhaps the best argument for Cold War II, because the alternative could be Hot War Three. Uh, remember, what Britain got wrong was that it didn't deter Wilhelmine Germany from an increasingly aggressive strategy that ultimately spilled over into war in 1914, and it failed to deter Germany again in the 1930s. To my mind, the real lesson of Cold War I is that the United States succeeded in deterring the Soviet Union from risking a hot war, and we avoided World War III. That's why when I started making the case for Cold War II, I was trying to point out that it, it really is a positive development that we recognize the conflicts of interest, the strategic competition in HR's terms. Because I think if we don't, we'll, ris re we'll re risk repeating the mistakes that Britain made with Germany, failing to deter an increasingly ambitious uh, and aggressive power that thinks it's time that it had its place in the sun. So I, uh, I guess I uh, kind of feel like it's two against one here, but I'll-, I'll It I'll, is. I'll value <laughs> hey, we, we love you though, John, we love you. <laughs> Look, uh, let's, let's take a specific one. Um, a country in Africa needs a port. Uh, 
Uh, many countries in Africa need ports. Is the U.S. about to get into the business of building infrastructure in Africa? The U.S., good old bankrupt U.S., who's now, you know, we're, we're now borrowing another trillion dollars a month in our, uh, to, to rack up our debt. What we have, we don't have the financial capability nor the national will to do that. I mean, imagine either party now saying, oh yeah, we're gonna take a trillion dollars and start spreading around the world to build other, other people's ports. You know, the Cold War, though we won it, was not a pretty war. Uh, in Africa, if we wanted influence, what we would do is uh, we would support all sorts of autocrats and dictators. Uh, are we supposed that the country is corrupt and they're taking money from the Chinese and allowing the Chinese to build them a port? Are, are we gonna one-up them with more corruption? Is, are we gonna look for, as LBJ famously say, he may be an SOB, but he's our SOB around the world. I mean, that's, I, to be practical about how are, you, how are you gonna compete with that, I think you have to be practical. I, I wanna close with, you know, econ there's this competition, economic competition, the competition to export to other people more than they export to us. That's a, that's a lovely 17th and 18th century view. I don't think HR or I are making that case, John. And, and I, I think uh, you should resist the temptation to pretend that about we are. China dominating industries because its government plan is going to send them into dominating industries. The way you dominate industries is by innovating and competing. Yes, competing. Competing by producing better products at lower cost not by forcing other people out. The China may have a vision that we're gonna build all sorts of stuff, chips. I remember when memory chips was the great object of industrial policy and, and Japan stole it from the US just as it became a commodity about as good as number two red winter wheat for, uh, for world domination. I think the Chinese are, are on the run for the same thing. Uh, you know, just because they have this vision, Khrushchev famously said, our, our, our planning is going to bury the United States because we have a vision that we're going to dominate economic as the efficiency of state planning. Well, that worked out great, didn't it? So I, I just think the U.S., uh, I am all with you guys uh, on, on the containment strategy, on the political element of it, which has to be joint with allies. The, the, the club of international nations insisting that China, if it wants to play with this club, play by the rules. Uh, but the idea that we need to get into a state-run economic competition that we do by stopping them uh, rather than being better at it ourselves, I think is a mistake. But, but, but that's a straw man, John, and you know it. The, the point that I think HR started with is that we admitted China to the World Trade Organization and, and we simply turned a blind eye to its breaking the rules. The reason Huawei is dominant in 5G networks is not that it's the most competitive uh, economically, uh, in your terms, it's because it's state subsidized, uh, it's state backed, and it can underbid any competitor in terms of financing and price for that reason. Uh, so China doesn't play by the rules, and without rules, there really can't be global free trade. And for too long, we turned the blind eye to that. And you, you, you can get people in the Bush and Obama administrations to acknowledge that now. But so what, if Huawei, if, if you know it's secure, uh, now there's this issue of are there security- Hang on a second, did you just say if you know it's secure? By the way, we're using yeah. Zoom for this conversation, despite the fact that it's just recently been revealed that Zoom uses Chinese servers and therefore our conversation is very probably being recorded by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, goodbye probably to my visa next time I want to fly to Beijing, if there is a next time. So, uh, so, so I think the, the, the answer to your question is, you know, what for what is, what is the purpose, right? What what is what is the Chinese Communist Party trying to achieve? And, and and what they're trying to achieve by dominating the 5G infrastructure is to control the data that flows across that infrastructure. And once they control that that data, to use it to their exclusive, non-competitive uh, benefit. And so I, I would agree with you. We don't want to we don't want to compete with them for like every port and every airfield. I mean, goodness knows. I mean, you know, the port that they put in Sri Lanka, you know, there, there was no demand, you know, for for that port. They built it for military purposes essentially, and and we we don't have the resources. We shouldn't waste our resources on it. Now, I, I would like to ask you and Neil to comment on this because I'm the non-economist here and non-economic historian. Um, and, but to me, I think we ought to talk maybe a little bit about the weaknesses of, of China's model and the weaknesses of the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, for me, as, you know, as, as a historian, I look at this, it looks like an international Ponzi scheme to me, what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, right? Where, where they're they are using 
you know, Chinese banks to go in to make Chinese loans for Chinese companies to do the work to use Chinese products, right, to, that they are producing uh, based on the overcapacity and overproduction in, in China to dump those products into, into these markets. And, and to do so in pro projects, they're not going to give them any return on investment. I mean, look at the Djibouti Ethiopian, you know, rail line, you know, for example, or, or, the, or the dam in Ecuador, or you could use, I mean, so many of these examples. And I guess the question is, when does this come back to haunt them? I mean, aren't they over leveraged? I mean, we are too, I guess, you know, but, but they've financed a lot of this uh, based on, 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 on real estate that really is, a, a lot of it's unoccupied. And so um, I'm just, I'm just, it seems to me that this global economic slowdown associated with, with COVID, this recession, depression, whatever it is, already compounding what was already uh, de declining uh, growth in, in China, and then compounded by, I think, very poor investments and, 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 and decisions that are not based on, 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 on how, how John would advise somebody <laughs> to make a decision based on economic considerations, but instead based on their geostrategic aspirations. I mean, what, what happens? What, what do you see as, as the vulnerabilities in the Chinese Communist Party's uh, 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 policy, the policies and, and the grip on power associated with that? That's I mean, exactly they, my point. You know, when you were complaining about Belt, Belt and Road, Here's a, an underdeveloped country, China still, who's spending its money developing stuff in other countries. If they build a rail line in Djibouti and Djibouti defaults, what are they going to do about it? The rail line's in Djibouti. You, you, you know, they, they can nationalize it. They can default on it. Uh, you, if, if Djibouti doesn't feel like paying and doesn't feel like signing up with China, tough luck. The rail line's there. Carmen Reinhardt has done some interesting research on this, uh, suggesting that there's probably a really large hidden default uh, that a lot of China's uh, investments, uh, even before COVID-19, have probably gone bad. Uh, and that would also be part of the kind of familiar story of empire. Uh, you, you make these decisions for strategic reasons. Don't be surprised if they, if they suck uh, economically. But HR has, I think, raised a really important question that we should perhaps wrap with. And that is, you know, is the Chinese Communist Party entirely secure uh, in its position? Uh, most people in the West overestimated the strength of the Soviet economy and underestimate the fragility of the system right up until it disintegrated in 1989 to 91. Hardly anybody actually at the time predicted that. And indeed, the CIA tended to to think that we were underestimating rather than overestimating the Soviet Union. I, I think we might be just making a similar mistake with, with China. Uh, there, there are lots of reasons to be skeptical about China's economic future, even before the pandemic exposed all the, the political governance issues that are, that are wrong there. The demographics are terrible. There's a huge debt burden. There's obviously been a great deal of very unproductive investment. Uh, there's overcapacity in heavy industry. And, and as it, the economy grapples with its biggest uh, reverse since the time of Chairman Mao, they're scratching their heads in Beijing, wondering if they're going to have to get the old playbook out of, uh, of debt financed infrastructure investment to keep the show on the road. Although the heavy industrial state owned enterprise sector is bouncing back, because that's really part of the the Communist Party's planning apparatus. I don't see the Chinese consumer rushing back at weekends into the shopping malls. In fact, traffic is still very, very down in the major Chinese cities. Uh, and, and in the weekends, not, not during the week, people are being sent back to work, uh, but they are not going out shopping, uh, which means that I don't think China's recovery will be a true, a true V-shaped recovery. How does Xi Jinping's legitimacy stand up to this great failure that their propaganda is trying to efface. We don't know, but I think if there's one lesson of the Cold War, it's don't overestimate your opponent for reasons that John will entirely agree with. It's a fundamentally flawed system. At its core is planning and state control, uh, and that can only ultimately breed uh, the kind of problems that eventually did for the Soviet Union. That's why in, on balance, despite all the problems that John's talked about that the United States has, and I'm alive to those problems too, on balance, I'm an optimist here, because I don't think the lesson of history is that one party states with highly centralized systems of decision making ultimately prevail over democracies, which for all their flaws are relatively decentralized 
accountable systems where when people screw up, it gets called out pretty quickly. John, why don't you respond and we'll let HR close the broadcast. Okay, uh, yeah, I agree. We're gonna uh, contain on the political and military end. Um, uh, and the best thing we can do is to watch our own backyard and make sure the US is a healthy, innovative economy uh, that alone will, will spread its world and then wait for it to fall apart, which uh, it surely must sooner rather than later. Um, they, they're showing every sign of being scared. And I think that's exactly right. We, we don't have to push uh, too hard on that. Well, and I'll just say I agree with John on that point, and I agree with Neil as well. We have to focus on, on making ourselves better so that we can compete more effectively. We have to be, I think, introspective to win in this competition. I think that, you know, in, in recent decades, we swung from really over-optimism almost to defeatism or at least resignation in this competition with China. Remember at the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the Cold War, many assumed that there was this arc of history that had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open uh, uh, democratic systems, uh, as well as our free market econo economic system. Uh, we assumed that what would emerge in the post-Cold War period would be this great power condominium where we would all work together cooperatively to solve the world's uh, greatest problems. You know, how did that work out in context of, of global health when you're dealing with the Chinese Communist Party and a World Health Organization that is infiltrated and subverted by them? And, and we assumed that, you know, this, this phenomenon would occur that, that people even labeled put a label on global governance. I mean, it was all delusional, I think. And so we're, we're in a period now where we've, we've had a shock of some correctives that ought to bring us back to reality, that we do need to compete more effectively, that we do need to work more closely with like-minded partners and other free and open democratic systems to strengthen our governance, to strengthen our, our economic systems, to, to create more equality of opportunity for all of our people, to, to work to reverse the polarization in our polities so we can have meaningful discussions of how we get better uh, as a society. We can do that, thank goodness, right? because we are an open democratic society. There is no such debate going on in, in China right now. And so I think we ought to be, we ought to be proud of who we are, we ought to be confident, uh, but, but certainly, you know, we, we also recognize certainly as we face this COVID-19 crisis, the economic crisis associated with it, we, we, can, we can't be complacent about it, right? And, and, uh, and so uh, I think that these sort of discussions, I hope, contribute to us understanding better the nature of these competitions. It's certainly a great education for me every time I get to, to listen to Neil and, and John and, and engage in this discussion. And, and Bill, thank you so much for, for putting this together for us and giving us this weekly opportunity uh, to see each other, albeit at a distance, and, and albeit uh, without maybe what might be our beverage of choice for these kind of discussions. <laughs> okay, let's stop it there. Uh, Neil, not to traumatize you too much, but did you feel like this was a Canadian doubles match? <laughs> <laughs> you mustn't mention tennis again. It's a very, very delicate subject with me. It brings back nightmarish memories of John McEnroe-like behavior on a Scottish tennis court when I was 15 years old. I'm sorry, my friend. We'll be back next week for a whole new installment of Goodfellows, maybe new topics. Maybe we'll still be talking about this next week. On the behalf of Hoover's Goodfellows, John Cochran, Neil Ferguson, H.R. McMaster, all of us here at the Hoover Institution, we wish you and yours the best. Stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy. We'll do our best on our end here at the Hoover Institution to help you stay informed. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.